Welcome to podcast number seven with the Sisters of Thunder. I'm Kathy Baldock. I'm Yvette Schneider. And we're going to do, I'm actually pretty excited to do this. Uh, Was it two podcasts ago we spoke about the policy paper that came out of the Family Research Council, and I've got to do the dig again. Your old employers. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's always throw of it under the bus time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we did a policy paper that they did, and I think it was a 51-page paper. They did an intro. They did a part that they called science and hmm, psychology of transgender people written by a a, a journalist, uh, uh, an uneducated about this issue journalist. And then Peter Spriggs did the policy. And we'll talk, I'll probably drag that back in because this paper talks about policy too. But Yvette, why don't you tell us what we're going to discuss today? Because it's fascinating. Okay. So the American Psychological Association released what they're calling guidelines for psychological practice with transgender and gender nonconforming people. They just, the Council of Representatives for the American Psychological Association adopted this on August 5th and 7th of 2015. This is for psychologists, not all mental health professionals, psychologists only, PhDs in psychology or doctorates of psychology, um, on how to be good practitioners and ethical practitioners for people who they are calling in this paper transgender and gender nonconforming. So that's already the terminology I mean, they, well, they're very the whole paper. They're very it. respectful because they do they do give a qualification at the bottom that says for the purposes of these guidelines, we use the term transgender and gender nonconforming TGNC. We intend for the term to be as broadly inclusive as possible and recognize that some TGNC people do not ascribe to these terms. Now, the whole purpose of this is just to show therapists, psychologists, this is how we would like you to deal with anyone who comes into your practice who is gender nonconforming or transgender. And so they call it, as we go through the paper too, they're calling things guidelines and they're calling things standards. Right. So the difference between a standard and a guideline is a standard is a rule. They have to abide by it. So think of ethics. You can't be in business with one of your patients. You can't have a sexual relationship with one of your patients. Those are hard and fast rules. These are guidelines which they call aspirations. Right. This is what we are aspiring to do. And they realize in 2009, the task force, the American Psychological Association Task Force on Gender Identity and Gender Variance found out that less than 30% of psychologists and graduate students reported familiarity with TGNC right. issues. So they I was said, surprised okay, by that we need to do something about this. And that is when this, this task force of 10 people came together to study the issue. Now, there are 10 people on this task force. And five of they're all psychologists, obviously. Five of them are transgender or gender nonconforming themselves and five are cisgender. One thing I wanted to say here is that in the past we've we've heard about lawsuits. There was one very popular one about two or three years ago where a woman going through an accredited program said that her religious beliefs wouldn't let her counsel either homosexuals or transgender people. And the the head of the department said, well, then you know what? You're out. And the religious right and the conservative Christians got all up in arms about that because she was being repressed from expressing her religious rights. But that's not a way it works in the a licensing. The American Psychological Association has standards that it develops based upon scientific research. It's right. not up upon opinion. It's not upon the way they would like things to be. These are studies. And like you pointed out, there are 17 pages worth of, yes. of studies and references in this paper. And in 2009, the APA Council of Representatives adopted what they called the Resolution on Transgender, Gender Identity, and Gender Expression Non-Discrimination. 
Okay, so this is this yeah. calls upon psychologists in their professional role. So if you are going to be a psychologist, this is what it calls for you to do, to provide appropriate, non-discriminatory treatment. It encourages psychologists to take a leadership role in working against discrimination. It uh, supports the provision of adequate and necessary mental and medical health care, recognizes the efficacy, benefit, and medical necessity of gender transition, supports access to appropriate treatment in institutional settings, and supports the creation of educational resources for all psychologists. So if you can't abide by the standards of an association that you want to join, then don't join. And and students ought to be knowing that when they go to, say, I don't know, our closest school that offers a degree in psychology. But you go to there and, you, you know, it's a, a degree university. And a student signing up for that ought to know that this is what's to be expected of me. So, and then the other thing, just before we get into this, is that I hear way too often is that's just a bunch of liberal medical mumbo jumbo. These people have been pushed around by the gay community to come up with this liberal stuff. This is based on studies. I was, I, as if you've been listening to these podcasts, you know, I'm a footnote junkie. I'm a studies junkie. I want everything substantiated. And I was so impressed with the work that has, got, they would barely go two sentences where they would cite three studies. No, this took six years to put together. These guidelines took six years for this task force to come and agree upon and uh, obviously all based on studies. This is, I think it's an incredible. And if there are paper. areas where the studies aren't sufficient, they say that yes, we they don't do. know enough yet to have a specific guideline. This is what we're going to do in the meantime, until we know more, this is how we're going to handle it. And we haven't known about this issue very long because it was only in the late sixties that, uh, um, in 65, that a psychiatrist, John Olivan just was trying to even label this group this group of people, because he could see that they were transgender people uh, that that seemed to be in non um, conformance with their biological sex, that something was happening in their brains. It was a very new subject. Christine Jurgensen was the first person in the early 50s that came back to the United States as this. You know, the headlines were blonde GI bombshell comes back. So in 19, the early 1950s, I think it was 1953, this was an incredibly new concept. But there were also a subgroup that were called transvestites. So transvestites were people who got some kind of sexual or erotic pleasure at dressing up in the clothes of the opposite gender or sex. And then there were also drag queens, drag kings, all kinds of people. And when Olivin termed this or coined this term in 1965 as transgender, he was trying to differentiate that there are people that have this dissonance between their brain and their genitals. And there are people that do dress up cross-dressing for erotic pleasures or other pleasures. And he said, they are not the same, and I am going to create a word, and he created the word transgender. But unfortunately, both communities co-opted the word transgender. So for 40 years, there has been this blurring of lines between what is transgender, what is transsexual, what is transvestite. And so I really applaud this group. Although there's still blurring going on, they're trying to say this is about gender and non-conforming gender. This is a big thing. This is a big thing. It hasn't, this hasn't even been published right. yet. It will be published. And when it is, it will be published in the American Psychologist, which is the uh, publication of the American Psychological Association. But a psychologist friend gave me a copy so of this. So congratulations. I was so surprised when the day she yeah. received it, she printed it out and gave me a copy. So I appreciate that very much because she knew that this is important. So yes. There are 16 guidelines that this report gives to psychologists. And guideline, guideline number one is psychologists 
and this is important, psychologists understand that gender is a non-binary construct that allows for a range of gender identities and that a person's gender identity may not align with sex assigned at birth. So gender identity is defined, and this is how the APA defines it, as a person's deeply felt inherent sense of being mm -hmm. a girl, woman, or female, a boy, a man, or male, a blend of male or female, or an alternative gender. And they also point out that it wasn't until uh, westernization and colonialism right. Right. that... Didn't you find that interesting? I found that very interesting. Wow. And of course, they have a source for that, that, that <laughs> many cultures in which gender nonconforming persons and groups were visible, once westernization and colonialism came around, they were suddenly oppressed, wherein some, they had been embraced, they had been... Um, revered even in the for their diversity. Native American culture, two spirits. So, and 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 just as another little point, we're talking. They think the best numbers they have are a half a percent of the adult population. But as we go through this, we're going to find out that those numbers aren't even solid because. There's so much stigma still attached that people will not Yes, -identify. and the APA does recognize that and say, we think these numbers aren't what they right. could be if people were willing to admit openly. But since there are so many places where they can be denied employment and other such benefits, not everyone is going to be willing to talk about gender identity or being transgender. And I think this is a really strong statement that is made in that first guideline that you pointed out. It's, you know, where it specifically says, in many cultures and religious traditions, um, gender has been perceived of as a binary construct. So how often do we hear that? God made male or female. God made male and female only. And we know that that's not true because we also know that there are intersex people. So people want things to form along strict, not only sex um, binaries of male and female, but they want gender, which is that construct that you just talked about, to also form along strict binary guidelines of you are either male or female. You act either male or or female. It's either one or the other. And if you don't act one or the other, there is something wrong with you. Right. So this is why we're talking about also gender non-conforming people. This is very interesting because as you were talking about earlier, they are talking about as early as the 1950s, research yes. found variability in how individuals describe their gender with some participants reporting a gender identity different from the culturally defined, mutually exclusive categories of man or woman. So then they, they talk about now studies that were done in 2012 saying that of the transgender and gender nonconforming population, in the United States, 30 to 40 percent of participants identif identify their gender, gender identity as something other than man or woman. Isn't that amazing? I mean, they this just, is of the participants, but but still. And, and when you talked about that study back in the 50s, we talked about that when we were doing our, our webinar series, because when yes. we were talking about sex and gender and orientation, we talked about the man that first started bringing up. We, brought, we talked about money. John Money and why he introduced the concept of gender. And we also talked about Henry Benjamin, who did these studies in the 50s and 60s. And Henry Benjamin had a great heart. He was a man that was incredibly compassionate to his patients. And he said, let's talk kind of off the record. And that completely got skewed when it didn't just stay with the doctors. It went to right. libraries and universities. Right. And then it ended up as Pulp Fiction. So yep. I have a great deal of respect for Henry Pen Benjamin that did these first yes. studies. But you know what, Yvette? Someone's got to start it. Like Kinsey, somebody's got to start it. So these conversations have been started. And now we're getting somewhere. And now they're increasing. Yes. And I think when we, when you and I talked a couple of weeks ago about Family Research Council's paper and Boo. how they were <laughs> trying to conflate transgenderism with mental health issues, saying 
there's something mentally wrong with people who had and that they should seek change. That is completely opposite of what the American Psychological Association, people who are actually mental health experts are saying. But you and can what see, they say in here right, is you're gonna a get person's yep. identification as transgender, gender, gender nonconforming can be healthy and self-affirming and is not inherently pathological. These are the mental health experts talking here. These are experts. So we've got to keep saying, this is what the experts say. So when people try to give me their opinions, I say, yes, wonderful. Yay. Thank you very much. But I would rather hear from the experts because they will, they will take what you just said about there can be mental, mental, there are no mental health issues. And they'll say, but there are. And, and then this paper will tell us that right. those mental health issues are due to stigmatization. And it says, however, people may experience distress as yes. associated with discordance between their gender identity and their body or sex assigned at birth, as well as societal stigma and discrimination. Yeah. So the health care that you would go to a psychologist to help you with would be to alleviate the gender dysphoria. Right. Which they also say is largely reinforced <laughs> by the binary conceptualization of gender. An... Like that is where the problem comes by saying this is what a man is. This is what a woman is. And you either fall into this camp or this camp. Because the because the pressure for so long, so even and and I this is an this is like transgender conversation advanced five hundred one you know so when you say to somebody, are you passing? We again have constructed those gender binaries of what a male looks like and what a female looks like. And I remember about a year ago, I was in a in the Orange County Library with one of my editors, Wendy, and. There was a, a trans woman in the library, and I had to stop my own judgments. I, even, who is a great advocate <laughs> right. for the trans community, had to stop and catch my... It was just that last hanger on in my head that said, okay, so if a trans woman is trying to pass, this is what she should look like. Well, this trans woman, obviously a trans woman, came to the counter near where we were, um, had a short blue jean skirt on and long hair, a severely receded head, hairline that had, you know, obviously decades of testosterone, had, you know, pretty earrings on, nice jewelry, did nothing beyond that to alter her voice. And even my brain said, well, you know, this is pretty offensive. She's not doing a good job in passing. And that's exactly what this says. Oh, that's my goodness. Exactly Slap me in the face. It says causes <laughs> the issues. <laughs> <laughs> because even though I'm, you know, we may be willing and like, check yourself. You may be willing to let a person be you know, you may be willing to to accept that and respect that a person is trans, but then what are you doing about still trying to force them into what gender binaries look like? Right. Oh right. my goodness. Right. So much to learn. Okay. So that was guideline one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're not going to get to all 16 because the last few have to do with research and teaching and things like that. See, but... this is what happens. This is, you should go for a hike with us. Yeah. It's just like we get to the parking lot and we still stand there and then the dark closes then, in. Gotta right. go home. <laughs> and then Kathy pulls out her headlamp. <laughs> So guideline number two, psychologists understand that gender identity and sexual orientation are distinct but interrelated constructs, which means that sexual orientation is defined as a person's sexual and or emotional attraction to another person, which doesn't always have to do with gender identity, which is defined by a person's felt inherent sense of gender. So I had this conversation just this week with a friend that I won't out who <laughs> said he, I'll give him a he, he said, so I'm not getting this. So um, this person transitioned to female and you know, was that person then should be attracted to this. And I said, you can't do that. Well, see, that's very interesting. So they go on to say, just as some people experience their sexual orientation as being fluid or variable, and of course they're Reference is my favorite, Lisa Diamond. Lisa Diamond, yeah, she's a whole... She's From a, 2013, <laughs> not 
1967. <laughs> and, we love those and reports. Some people also experience their gender identity as fluid. Yes. Especially younger people. And I think we're going to get to that yes, piece about children, which is, I thought, fascinating. Yes, too. absolutely. Um, focusing solely on gender orientation as the cause for discordance may obscure awareness of a of a transgender, gender nonconforming identity. So if you go to a therapist and they're saying they're trying to deal with it as a sexuality issue, that's a problem yes. rather than a gender issue. So they're saying they can, a psychologist may, exi- may help people to differentiate between what sexual orientation is and what gender identity is because so, the person themselves may. So this is really interesting. So this brings up, um, so I've had people say to me, who should I go to? Uh, my spouse just came out as trans or my child just came out as gay. And Christians uh, will want to go to a Christian therapist because that's kind of what we've been taught in the evangelical world that we go to someone that, you know, the pastor recommends. Well, you've already said to us that 30 percent of licensed psychologists. And these are psychologists. Yes. Frankly, a lot of people that who identify themselves as Christians and mental health professionals are master's levels, pra- master's level practitioners, which some of them can be great. And I'm not going to say they're not because I do know of some who are absolutely excellent. But one thing I think listeners should know is that they don't have to go through their own course of therapy in order to get a master's degree in marriage and family therapy or anything else. When you go to a psychologist, they have had years of therapy themselves. And this paper is only for psychologists, so only for doctors. So we have, so we have as few as, or perhaps the level is, 30% of licensed people have experience with this. So I would only say that inherently that would make less number of Christian counselors because there's such a stigma within the Christian world about sexual orientation other than heterosexual <clears throat> and um, gender identity other than cisgender, which is which is brain and what's in your head and your underpants matching. So if a person is listening and their spouse or themselves or their children are gender nonconforming or someone in that realm is transgender or trying to trying to work through these issues of where I am, they really need to understand that they need to go to a, a psychologist, a therapist, somebody yes. that is educated in this issue so that it doesn't get blown off. And that is easy to ask when you call. Yes. Because they have to tell you. Yes. And so if they're licensed by the, well, still. We just, we just discovered that even if they're licensed by the APA, it doesn't mean they have experience in this. No. And if they're licensed by the APA and, and when we say APA, we're talking about the American Psychological Association. Most psychiatrists now who are MDs, they, they're doctors of medicine and they've also had psychological training. They are psychiatrists and most of them now just dispense medications they give you 15, 20 minutes. They're not for therapy. Hmm. There are some that are who are analysts, but most, mostly now they're not. Mostly now the doctors who are mental health professionals are psychologists, and that's what these guidelines are for. Um, so the guideline number three is, and Kathy's going to love this one, <laughs> psychologists seek to understand how gender identity intersects with other cultural identities as TGNC yes. people. Um, so the sentence that I thought that was wonderful here was, um, and they say it's so much better than why should we try to, to float around this thing, the, to quote it, gender identity and gender expression may have profound intersections with other aspects of identity, St- studies quoted. These aspects can include but are not limited to race, ethnicity, age, education, socioeconomic status, immigration status, occupation, disability. HIV status, sexual orientation, relational status, and or religious or other spiritual affiliations. That stuff. So I know that even in just the LGB community, it's more difficult to come out in Asian families, 
in black families and a lot of ethnicities. Well, these are these are the examples they give. It says TGNC people who transition may not be prepared for changes in <sighs> privilege or societal yes. treatment based on gender identity and gender expression. So they're giving examples to the psychologists saying these are other issues that you will need to address. So you and, don't treat a white privileged person the same way you may treat an, a, a female Asian well, person. Well, as a mental health professional, they would have to help their patient navigate this yes. in the world. And, and these are the illustrations that they give. An African-American trans man may gain male privilege, but may face racism and societal stigma, particular to African-American men. So in that situation, the psychologist would then help the trans man deal with now being an African-American man. <laughs> so now you do have some male privilege, but at the same time, you're going to be looked at with more suspicion then because you were maybe the religion will kick in. Well, then <laughs> that 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 is also what they cover. But and here's another one: an Asian American Pacific Islander trans woman may experience the benefit of being perceived as a cisgender woman, right? The right. finer Asian yes. features, but may also experience sexism, misogyny, and objectification, particular to Asian American Pacific Islander cisgender women. So this, I mean. It is not as easy as we imagine it to be. So this is why this is why we're covering this. That I, I, when you showed me this paper, I was thrilled that psychologists have been studying this and and uh, sensitively, intelligently, with research, studying this for six years so that they can advise their membership. Because I I loved. I was so encouraged it's by such this paper. a thoughtful, well oh. put together, well put together paper. Um, the other thing that falls under this guideline is finding an affirmative expression for their religious or spiritual beliefs and traditions, including positive relationships with religious leaders can be an important resource for TGNC people. Yeah. Religion. I mean, we can't discount these. It's not. We you, can't. You can't throw we cannot. Away. And and everybody will say. Gay people will say. Um, everybody should have the right to say. But because we're just understanding who gay people. Well, we got a little bit better handle on gay people. But we're just understanding who trans people are. You think that because you got one story, like okay, I know who Laverne Cox is, or I got right. Chaz Bono down, or yeah, I'm getting Caitlyn Jenner. I got this thing nailed. Oh, no, no. The complexities of all these pieces that go in around surrounding the the issues of gender identity and how it intersects all those other pieces of their lives. It just makes their story so unique. So if you know one trans person, yay, yay for you, go meet another. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll lend you some, but you got to give them back. <laughs> So this is guideline four. Psychologists are aware of how their attitudes about and knowledge of gender identity and gender expression may affect the quality of care they provide to TGNC people and their families. Okay, so we have already covered this because, and they do say, look, the APA Ethics Code of 2010 specifies that psychologists practice in areas only within the boundaries of their competence. So... No, no psychologist who actually accepts you as a patient, knowing that you are transgender or gender nonconforming, should even accept you as a patient without being a specialist. They oh, really need, without knowing these issues. Otherwise, they would they would have to refer you to someone else. And that's that's a standard. That's but a they also have that is part that is a standard. That's part of the ethics code that you have to if if you're if you're an expert in anxiety and depression, but not someone who's actually actively suicidal and having suicidal ideations, then you need to say, I'm an expert in relationships. I'm an expert in depression. I'm an expert in anxiety, but you need to go to someone who 
knows exactly what to do with someone who's contemplating and actively contemplating suicide. That that's just the way it goes. That that those are part of the codes, the ethics codes. And so this this section also starts with <laughs> this is kind of a, a logical statement. Psychologists like other members of society come to their personal understandings and their acceptance of different aspects of human diversity through their own process of socializ socialization. So the way I prefer to say that is the same way I do in the book. We all look at people and instances in my in the book for me it was we are looking at the LGBT community through a series of lenses that have come to us culturally socially through our legal system and through our religious beliefs but as psychologists and mental health professionals again in this ethics code of 2010 they have to base their work upon established scientific and professional knowledge so yeah. you can't say, well, I'm a psychologist who's a Christian, so I can't be accepting of trans people. It's like, well, is that based upon scientific and professional knowledge? Because if it's not, then you're violating the code of ethics. So just just as an aside, and I hadn't planned on asking you this, so if a, 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 a psychologist does break that code of trying to counsel someone, okay, you've got, I see you, no, they wouldn't say, I see you have a penis. That would be really weird. But <laughs> you, let's hope not. Okay, that would be another <laughs> guideline you've broken. Okay, like, that's an old standard. Okay, so you tell me you have a, you, you know, you're biologically male and um, I can't counsel you any other way. Should, what happens ethically with that? Should the person just go running out the door or report them to the APA? What happens with that? Well, if they if they didn't know you were trans and you're sitting there and then you reveal it and they don't know anything what about to do, it, yeah. then they then then they have to pass you on to someone else. They have to. They have to. Okay. Because they're not versed in that. Okay. They're not an they're not an expert. They haven't done the work that they've needed to do. What they're calling for in this paper is saying, look, there are very few who are experts and later guidelines are you need to step it up. People <laughs> yes. need to get educated yes. so that they are experts in this. And I'm going to say it again. I love this paper. Now, if I someone were to, and if, if a doctor did know that you were trans and you came in and they were treating you in a less than friendly manner, then you would go to the board. And there are boards in every state. There are state psychological associations as well, like Nevada. So, you know, where you're licensed not in the United States, you're licensed in your state. And there are state boards where you file complaints and they have a panel. And the panel is comprised of psychologists and also a lay person. In every state, there's a lay person on the board that hears all ethics complaints. Yeah, this is this is just this. It's just wonderful to hear that there's so much um, oversight, oversight and education and research that's gone behind on this, and that has been going on for a while. With, you know, like I didn't know, but yeah, go ahead. You're the you're the one leading this. So one. guideline number five is psychologists recognize how stigma, prejudice, discrimination, and violence affect the health and well-being of TGNC people. These are the statistics that they are using, um, that TGN people are at risk of experiencing anti-trans prejudice and discrimination in educational settings. Okay, I think we already know this. Um, I'm not going to go into all the other types, but, but just going to this one, it says... In a national representative sample of 7,898 LGBT youth in K through 12 settings, so in order for um, in order for a study to be considered something that could um, be generalized for the population as a whole, you need to have at least 2,000. They have almost 8,000 that they studied this here. Is, this is great because I hear of, you know, some some people will do, like, you know, some yeah. of the Here's my study, 200 people, 200. 200 people that are all earning their paychecks off of yeah. the gay industry. And you can't generalize. Then then that is a study. This, the sample size is too small. Otherwise, you need to do, if you have a smaller sample size, you need to do a longitudinal study, which is what Lisa Diamond did with women to find out their sexuality, which means that instead of sitting down and filling out this form, a researcher would follow you for a, a number of years. Mm -hmm. That's the way you get over a small sample size by saying, I followed these people for 10 years. 
like Lisa wow. Diamond did. And I checked in with them every two years. But in this, in, in, in school settings, uh, LGBT, so they're talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual, as well as transgender, 55.2% yeah. of participants reported verbal harassment, 227 physical harassment, and 114 physical assault based wow. on their gender expression. <sighs> So, and, and then in a national community survey, TGNC adults, 15% reported prematurely leaving educational settings ranging from kindergarten through college as a result of harassment. This is, just, I mean, it's just amazing. So when we talked about a few weeks ago, we talked about the level of income of trans people in the United States. Well, they actually have 2014 statistics here. 2014. It says... Um, Almost half of a sample of TGNC older adults reported a household, household income at or below 200% of poverty. Wow. Okay, that's from 2014. From, from 2011, they found that TGNC people were four times more likely to have a household income of less than $10,000 in comparison to cisgender people. Now, doesn't it, it, you know, I just think of all of the, because, you know, I spend a lot of time in conservative forums because, you know, I, I'm trying to test the, the, um, the, the flexibility of my brain explosion capacity. So I, I spend a lot of time reading things and the, how this is reversed is amazing is, well, of course they're, you know, they're in rebellion to God. So God's not blessing them. The, the, those things have got to end because we've got research. We've got research and science by real researchers. So these are great numbers, Yvette. They're great numbers. You know, it was interesting because also in the Family Research Council's paper, it talks about, <laughs> it talks about people engaging in sex work to pay yes. for their surgeries or because it's a mental health issue and now they're prostitutes. Well, that's not what this says. And, and yeah. again, this is a 2011 study. Given widespread workplace discrimination and possible dismissal following transition, right. TGNC people may engage in sex work or survival sex. When an example of that is trading sex for food right. or sell drugs to generate income because they've either been fired or they can't get jobs because they're obviously trans. Right. They're, so they're not passing in that gender binary yep. that we're so, we're so desperate to keep people in. Yep. Well, people will be listening to this podcast in 20 years. And you know what's and they'll interesting? they'll say, boy, if things change. And I think that we know, we already know this, but it says peer support from other TGNC people has been shown to buffer the negative effect of stigma on mental health. Yeah. So Community. being part of a group, mm -hmm. seeking out others just to be around. Right. And it doesn't just mean to, just trans people. It means no, being no. in community. Right. Exactly. Accepting community. Yeah. Right. Um, let, guideline six, psychologists strive to recognize the influence of institutional barriers on the lives of TGNC people and to assist in developing TGNC affirmative environments. Yeah. So this continues on to that same thought. Right. Mm -hmm. And that they need to recognize that a lot of trans and, and gender nonconforming people are probably going to come in distrustful of you as a healthcare provider because they've had bad experiences in the past and because they've been pathologized in the past, told that there is something mentally wrong with them. So they may not be as trusting when they come in and then the therapist needs to expect that. So I was on a panel or I was on a presentation panel with a friend, Carrie, and we spoke to mental health care providers over a luncheon, you know, one of their... Uh, professional luncheons about probably about three years ago and th the people in the room were absolutely fascinated by this whole conversation on trans because here they were mental health care providers some of them were office managers they just had different sorts of levels but they couldn't imagine that there were as many trans people in the Reno Sparks area that they were because they had never seen them well when you're not set up to even handle them or when they come in and they just want a conversation about getting, you know, some more of their hormones that they've come to a new place, those are scary conversations for some trans people to have. And so, um, so mental health care professionals are changing and 
so I'm very grateful for Kim Johnson in our area that's working mm -hmm. with the Hope's House because they have a special group that is completely trans-friendly, trans-educated. We have some great doctors in this town, and I'm so impressed with what we have here, but I also recognize that a lot of other communities have this, where transgender people can be safe, safe in, the, safe in their education spaces, their workplaces, they're even going into their doctor's offices. So, so many people are still isolated. So because we have so much more left of this, we're going to stop now and then do a part two on this yeah. paper because it is very important and they do cover some very interesting I'm I'm really areas. anxious to, you know, the next podcast, please do listen to it because we're going to cover a pretty controversial topic of transgender children. Yes. And, and I do want to I do want to say one thing before we stop and that is again, these are guidelines, these are not standards, these are not rules. Um, but they but but the APA also says that these are intended to complement treatment guidelines for transgender and gender non-conforming people seeking mental health services and what they're using now in the meantime until they come up with their own until more studies are done so they're using uh treatment guidelines such as those set forth by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health Standards of Care. So you can look that up, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health Standards of Care and the Endocrine Society. That's wonderful. Yeah. So I, I hope you've enjoyed this, and I really appreciate Yvette bringing this to our attention because, as I said, this is this is cutting edge stuff. This is cutting edge. This <laughs> hasn't even been published yeah, yet. Yeah, so we want to be in that place. Uh, as we always say, we are completely about two things. We're completely about education and relationships. So thank you for listening. Turn in, tune in to, it will be number eight. This is the continuation of this APA paper. And we are the Sisters of Thunder. Thank you again, Butch, for the great name. <laughs> and I'm Kathy Baldock. And I'm Yvette Schneider. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.